So, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear participants. Welcome to Vienna and welcome to Boku University in this beautiful springtime. I hope you have already enjoyed the atmosphere at the campus. And it's my great pleasure to welcome all of you to the fifth European Citizen Science Conference. And this is a symposium, as we have just heard, that will be held together with the ninth Austrian Citizen Science Conference. It is a double conference here at Boko University and at the Natural History Museum in Vienna. Ladies and gentlemen, this year's conference is dedicated to the concept of change. And it will focus on the central role of citizen science, namely as a catalyst for change and the bridge connecting diverse communities to the field of scientific research. In a time that is characterized by rapid change and multiple challenges, citizen science is proving to be a powerful tool, a tool for democratizing science and fostering a deeper understanding of its principles in the broader society. And by empowering individuals and communities to actively engage in scientific efforts, we are paving the way for a more inclusive, informed and engaged society. So here at Boku University, citizen science, as I can proudly say, is not just a concept. It is a fundamental aspect of our research and educational endeavors. We have a long-standing tradition of engaging with citizen science across various disciplines. And we recognize its potential to enrich both the process and the outcomes of our work. As a coordinator center for Österreich forscht, and the Citizen Science Network Austria, BOKU is committed to advancing the practice of citizen science, not only within it, its institution, but also across Austria. And through collaborative partnerships and innovative initiatives, we strive to make citizen science accessible and impactful for all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, the topic of this year's conference, Change, reflects the dynamic nature of our world and the need for adaptive responses to emerging challenges. From environmental degradation to social inequality, the forces of change are ever present. Through citizen science, we have the opportunity not only to observe these changes, but also actively contribute to addressing them. And this conference provides a platform for exploring different perspectives on change and how to examine the role of citizen science in driving positive transformation in research and society. And on this occasion, I really want to express my gratitude to the organizers for their work in putting together this event. A special thanks to the team from BOKU and Florian Heigl and Daniel Dörler. I think they have deserved an applause. Thank you. So thank you very much. You are the pioneers of citizen science, not only in, at BOKU, but in Austria. For, thank you very much for dedicating uh, your efforts to this event. I'm really confident that this conference will be a fruitful and inspiring experience for all of us. So may this conference bring many new inspirations, foster deeper connections and catalyze positive transformation in our communities and beyond. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish you all an interesting and fruitful conference. Have a nice day. Thank you, Eva Schulef Steindl. Yeah, there are different levels of focus on citizen science across Europe, and there are also different framework conditions. In Austria here, we are proud that the awareness also the development and the funding of citizen science is at a high level. 
The ministry began to support citizen science as early as 2007. The, uh, for example, the sparkling uh, project, uh, sparkling science began. And the Ministry of Education, Science and Research is represented by Director General for Scientific Research, International Relations, Gender Equality and Diversity Mainstream, Barbara Weitgruber. Sektionschefin, as we say, and Barbara Weitgruber is also member state co-chair of Iraq. Applause for Barbara Weitgruber. Dear Rector, dear Chair, dear Managing Director, dear Director General, dear Founders and Coordinators of Österreich Forscht, as Director General, I'm very happy and proud um, to be here and welcome you on behalf of the Austrian Federal Ministry of Education, Science and Research at the opening of this fifth European Citizen Science Conference. I'm convinced, um, as the Rector also said, that this event will make a significant contribution to further strengthen the role of participation of citizens in research, in research processes and also to highlight the potential of citizen science for change. The world is facing unprecedented social, environmental and economic challenges that will require policymakers, business, academia and citizens to open up to one another and find new ways of collaborating. Citizen science allows to link and connect different levels of knowledge and know-how in order to achieve research goals in a more open and more inclusive manner than traditional methods. Citizen scientists, on the other hand, gain insight into scientific processes and the work of academic researchers. This awareness can help reduce barriers and build trust in scientific findings while also strengthening critical thinking skills. The Global Sustainable Development Report, which was published last year, explicitly states that science needs to adopt more inclusive processes to make scientific findings socially robust and widely trusted. The strengthening of the science policy society interface is vital. Having citizen science and participatory research embedded in funding and evaluation structures is one step in achieving this collaborative vision. Citizen science, among other approaches, can also help generate more relevant data on the SDG indicators and consequently support evidence-informed policymaking. The role of science and research for informed policymaking as well as trust in science and democracy are highly relevant both on the European but also on the national level. Therefore, citizen science is also an integral part of the European Research Area Policy Agenda 2022 to 2024. Austria, as many other member states are involved in the action line, bring science closer to citizens, which is reflected, for example, in the Plastic Pirates Go Europe project, um, a project where also the University of Natural Resources and Life Sciences Vienna is involved um, with students and pupils investigating plastic waste in rivers in order to develop concrete measures. And I'm, I'm very glad, and it was mentioned that um, the ministry is also about funding, um, that um, we will continue to fund for another three years this specific um, project. Um, like other European countries, Austria was also involved in the Mutual Learning Initiative on Citizen Science, Policy and Practice. So we profited both from an exchange of information and best practice, uh, but also in the joint development of recommendations for the further development of citizen science strategies. In Austria, trust in science, research and democracy has been a key priority for Minister Martin Polaschek, our minister, ever since he took office in December 2021. In this context, um, our ministry commissioned a study on the causes of science and democracy skepticism in Austria, which was published last year. The study underlined a close connection between skepticism towards science and skepticism towards democracy. Secondly, it also showed that while a majority of the population in Austria trusts science, there is a proportion of around 40% who see little impact of science and research in their everyday lives and therefore have little interest in science and research. So we see our biggest challenge as 
doing a successful outreach and a successful communication. We need uh, to better communicate to people the role of science and research in their everyday lives. And it's equally important to show that science and research are cornerstones of our democratic society, building blocks of our country and the engine for future development. Our ministry therefore launched a campaign, DN Austria, uh, reflecting that science, research, and democracy are part of our DNA and reaching out to the general public and encouraging them to actively engage with science and research, among others by presenting interesting facts in a popular scientific way, um, is one thing we are doing, but the campaign is of course also complemented by strategic measures and initiatives, starting from elementary pedagogy to general and vocational education and training to adult education, higher education, and to science and research as our ministry encompasses the whole chain of education. It's a pleasure for our ministry to be one of the co-sponsors of this conference. Um, and I would like to take this opportunity to thank everyone involved um, in organizing this conference, but especially the European Citizen Science Association, the Natural History Museum Vienna, Österreich Forscht, and the University of Natural Resources and Life Sciences Vienna and their teams, as well as everyone else behind the scenes who is not present probably now, um, but organizing, planning, and hosting this wonderful conference. So I also wish you a successful conference and a lot of inspiring discussions, hopefully leading to a new pathway for citizen science, not just in Europe, but beyond. Thank you. We all are subject to constant change, most of the time very rapid change. Sometimes it frightens us, but it also offers opportunities. Change and its different topics is, and its different aspects is the topic of this conference and organizers would like to highlight the potential of citizen science as a, as a positive change maker. The European Hub for Citizen Science is EXA, the European Citizen Science Association, and this is their fifth conference as we heard it. Please join me in welcoming the chair of EXA, Susanne Hecker, she is also head of the science program Society and Nature in the im Naturkunde Museum in Berlin, together with Dr. Riemann Schneider, Managing Director of EXA. Bitte. Hello. Um, first and foremost, I would like to thank um, Österreich Forscht, our partner, our anniversary partner, along with Boko University and the Museum for Natural History in Vienna for their incredible work and efforts uh, bringing this conference to life. We gather today to celebrate a significant milestone, the 10th anniversary of our collective journey in citizen science. This gathering is not only a celebration, but an opportunity to reflect and take stock and to prepare for the next decade. We find ourselves in an era marked by profound global challenges, where environmental and technological issues along with social and political unrest, demand our attention and call for action. Concurrently, the spread of misinformation is on the rise and trust in institutions is in decline, threatening to widen the gap between science and society. It is here, at this critical moment, that citizen science is proving to be an indispensable building block for the future offering a pathway to bridge divides and foster a more informed and engaged community. As we navigate these challenging times, citizen science stands out as a transformative force redefining the dynamics between science and society. It fosters a culture of awareness and adaptability by engaging the public in scientific endeavors. 
The participatory approach not only makes individuals a part of the solution, but also lays the foundation for a more resilient and robust democratic society, equipped to navigate the complexities of our times. Over the past decade, citizen science has been successful. We have not only advanced scientific knowledge, but also strengthens the bonds within communities, fostering greater trust in science and supporting evidence-based policy making. This journey has shown us that citizen science is more than just a collection of data and academic papers. It represents a movement towards breaking down the barriers between science and society, promoting a culture of collaboration and inclusivity. As we move forward into the next decade, let's harness the capabilities of citizen science to build a more sustainable, equitable and fair future for all. Let's think of this conference as an open door to the immense potential that we share. Let this be the time we empower and encourage each other to share bold and revolutionary ideas, create connections and actively participate in shaping our future. Thank you. Co-organizer of the conference is the Natural History Museum Vienna with a special day, a special citizen science day on a Saturday. The Natural History Museum not only looks back, it looks also forward and wants to make a significant contribution to a sustainable development. CEO and Director General of the Natural History Museum of Vienna is Katrin Woland. Let's give a big hand to Katrin. Ja, dear Rektor, um, Professor Schulef Steindl, dear Section Head, Max da Weidgruber, dear Dejan Bioschek, um, dear yeah, Dr. Mjumfu, dear participants, a warm welcome to Vienna, a warm welcome to all our guests online. It's great you made it. We as organizers have been overwhelmed by the number of participants. When we planned and wrote our proposal for the Federal Ministry for Education and Research, which supports us. Thank you very much, Barbara, on behalf of the Ministry. We also had to name risks in this VUCA world. So we identified the ongoing war in Europe, another pandemic, strikes, and in general, more frictions due to increasing economic imbalances. As risks, we also identified decreasing interest in science in general perhaps a low number of participants, little engagement, to little talks and workshops, ideas. But the contrary is the case. This is the biggest EXA conference ever. And in addition, we will celebrate 10 years of the existence of the Austrian network Austria Österreich Forscht and EXA, the European Citizen Science Association, both as entities to support the community, as entities to advocate for citizen science at different levels and as entities to run projects. This week, we celebrate the increasing power and visibility of citizen science. We celebrate the different projects and approaches to detect change in the environment, in biodiversity, in climate impact. We celebrate increasing insights into historical, social, or economic interdependencies gained by citizen scientists. We celebrate the different projects and approaches to empower citizens in order to participate in our science-based community. We celebrate also the progress in information sciences, which allow to connect, to visualize, and analyze data in new dimensions. We celebrate the large and growing community of all of you and your networks who are engaged in planning, running, financing and evaluating citizen science. And we will celebrate the diversity of projects together with an interested public next Saturday in the museum. I might there will be some more opportunities to say thank you 
at this conference in more detail, and specifically at our party on Thursday, I would like to say how grateful I am to work together with you, Daniel and Florian, since more than 10 years in the area of citizen science. We saw it, citizen science changing from loose ideas and idealistic projects to one pillar in the open science strategy of the European Union. We saw it changing from private initiatives to building blocks for the open science policy in Austria or the European funding programs such as Horizon Europe. We saw it changing from an expression of scientific independence to a neoliberal instrumentalization of unpaid scientific work. And we saw changing or better broadening from local associations to understand local environments to transboundary or even global initiatives relevant for planetary health. But now back with my mind here in this very room, thank you also to Helga, who developed into one of the key organizers and to Silke and Iris from the Natural History Museum, Vienna, to the EXA team, to our student helpers, and to all contributors to make this conference happen. So let's use this conference to celebrate and to reflect changes, chances, and the rule of citizen science for the good of society. Thank you very much for your attention. Austria has a very active citizen science community, as we heard. The nerve centers for citizen science in Austria is the Citizen Science Network Austria and also the platform Österreich Forscht. Both are run by the founders, Florian Heigl and Daniel Dörler. Applause for the two gentlemen. It's, I think, <laughs> the third one. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> so we got our applause, we can go now. <laughs> yeah, welcome citizen science community to Vienna. We are very, very happy to host this year's EXA conference together with the annual Austrian citizen science conference in such a special year. As we already heard, uh, both EXA and the Austrian citizen science network are celebrating their 10th birthday. And what better occasion could there be than to celebrate this birthday with the biggest conference so far and, of course, a nice party? <laughs> the motto of the conference is change or Wandel in German. And the last 10 years have seen a lot of change in citizen science. 10 years ago, almost no one heard of citizen science, at least in Austria. Now, citizen science um, citizen science platforms across the continent are inviting people to get involved in research and to help shape citizen science. In Austria, we started with nine projects on Österreich Forscht. Now, more than 100 projects are listed on Österreich Forscht. And almost 50% of the Austrian population have at least heard of Österreich Forscht, so the, Aust the Austrian citizen science platform, as we recently found out in a representative survey. 10 years ago, citizen science conferences were hardly happening in Europe. Now, today, these gatherings of researchers, practitioners, decision makers and citizens are happening in many countries in Europe, often in their respective national languages, and they are building, building bridges between research, society, and policy. Conferences in Italy, in Denmark, Germany, Switzerland, Portugal, and many other countries are building communities of citizen science enthusiasts that are collaborating to tackle societal challenges, to discover secrets, and of course, have fun exploring together. 10 years ago, Results from citizen science projects were often frowned upon. Why should we trust results from a project 
where scientifically untrained citizens were involved. Why would anyone take this data seriously? Today, citizen science is growing stronger and stronger, with publications rising and citizen science making real impact, be it in biodiversity, health sciences, uh, humanities or social sciences. The contributions of citizens to research are becoming more and more recognized and we are very eager to find out what the next 10 years will bring. But there are also less positive changes. 10 years ago, the dismissal of science and research was not as prominent as it is today in Austria. Many people dismiss scientific results. They don't see relevance of research for their daily lives and they rather believe populists, uh, populist lies than research outcomes. Citizen science could be one of many ways to win these people back, to ensure the societal consensus that society can advance through science and research. We as a community are working hard every day to not only show people how science and research is done, but also to give them a stake in research, to give them a voice and to include their perspective. But this is a task that we all as a society need to tackle and we need help from decision makers, civil society and policy to convince people that science and research are important for their daily lives. In the next few days, we will discuss many aspects of citizen science and reflect what has, what has happened in the last 10 years. We are very much looking forward to fruitful discussions, lively workshops and of course also some celebrations. All this has only been possible through the generous help of the funders of the conference, the Federal Ministry for Education, Science and Research and the City of Vienna. We also want to thank our sponsors of the conference, Pensoft, the Friends um, of the Natural History Museum Vienna, um, and um, Spotteron, Adama, Henri Edu GmbH, and of course, EXA for the very good collaboration. We also want to thank our university, Boku University, and the Museum uh, of Natural History Vienna and their staff for being such great hosts. And Dr. Alexander van der Bellen, Federal President of the Republic of Austria, who has taken the patronage over this event. We wish you all a great time at this conference and we hope we will, you will leave inspired and with a smile. What's really important to know about the conference, where do you find what you need? Silke Schweiger provides you with the most important organizational details. Bitte sehr. So hello, a very warm welcome also from my side. I'm Silke Schweiger, member of the conference organization team. And I want to tell you some important facts, what you are expecting for the next days. So we close the conference desk here in the TV, and later on we have a conference office in the Schwakhöfer House. It's in Seminarum 4. You don't miss it. You will see the signs, you will find the ways. And you see I have this nice t-shirt and Every one of us has this t-shirt and if you have any questions, if you need information or you get lost, so don't hesitate to ask us, so we help you. Um, in the conference office, we have also the bags, the official conference bags, and we are an eco-event and therefore we are not allowed to fill the bags, so you have to fill the bags on your own with pens and with writing blocks, and we, need, we, are, here, we are there to help you, so please come and take your bags. Um, the... the, the we also have lists there for the, for the excursions because we are not fully booked for the excursions. If you want to participate for the excursions, also come to the conference office. Um, if you are, have the luck to have registered for the evening events for both days, um, you have the vouchers on your name badges. Please take the vouchers with you to the evening events because they are the tickets to go in the evening events. And if you do, can not participate to the evening event, but you have a voucher, please come to the conference office 
and give us your voucher. And everyone who is, was not lucky to get this voucher can come to the office and ask if we have a free place for the evening events. But please, this is important, take these vouchers with you. Um, for the poster presentations, everyone who is presenting a poster, please come to the conference office desk. There you will get a number. And with this number, you will find the place where you can pin up your poster. Please remember, we have two poster sessions on Wednesday and on Thursday. And take off your posters on Wednesday so that the colleagues have a free space on the next days. And we have a very special event for the poster presentations. You know we are in Vienna, and therefore it's the city of wine, and the poster presenters will get a bottle of wine and also some orange juice. <laughs> and, also, and you will get an empty glass. And if you're interested, you can go to a poster, take a glass of wine, drink a glass of wine, and talk to the colleagues. So I think this will be a very nice event. <laughs> And also, also thank you, also thank you to the Bokurektorat because they presented the wine and the wine is made here on the Boku from awarded winemakers. So it's a wine from the university here. So thank you very much. Um, if you um, also a welcome to the online participants. And if you are registered remotely, uh, later on, you can also ask questions. Only um, ask the questions in the Zoom, and one facilitator will then provide your question to the moderator. So, last but not least, um, we are an eco event, so therefore we want to um, reuse all the things. So please, uh, on your name badges, there is a clip. And after the conference, put this clip in the boxes in the conference office or at the Natural History Museum. You won't miss it. There are boxes. You can put it in. So a very warm welcome from our team. Welcome to Vienna. We hope you enjoy the conference. Have fun. We also will have fun and see you the next days. Thank you. <laughs>We have the vice, vice chair of Citizen Science Global Partnership and also chair of Citizen Science Africa Association, Maina Muniafo. We are delighted to have you here. Please give both a warm welcome. <laughs> the topic for this panel discussion is how to strengthen citizen science. What are the trends in Europe, maybe globally? And we are interested in three or four sub-items. Mainstreaming, which means, for example, integration into existing funding programs, but it's not the only aspect. Research assessment, or how does citizen science fit into new concepts of excellence? Benefits and added value of citizen science for the politics, and maybe there's still time for institutionalization, but I'm not sure. To get into the discussion and as a nice warm-up, I would like to start with the benefits and added value for the politics. As it was outlined in the invitation, this conference shall emphasize the potential of citizen scientists as pioneers of change in both research and society. 
In order to reach out to the general public, I believe you will first have to reach academia, and mostly important, you have to convince the policymakers. So let's focus on policy. Susanne Hecker, Chairwoman, can you pass the micro? Yes. Chairwoman of Accent, I'm certain you are used to arguing this aspects, this case. What is the added value, or should I say, what are the real benefits of citizen science in the context of national but also local level policy making? Yes, thank you very much. Um, also, hi from my side. Uh, I'm so glad to be here uh, in Vienna, um, and uh, thank you for having me uh, on this panel today. Um, before I dive into the very specific questions that you, that you raised, which are super important, I'd like to a step back uh, um, and um, also take um, um, the opportunity to uh, include what the speakers and, and uh, you said before. Because before we talk about the added values and benefits of citizen science for policy, I'd like to ask the questions, why is that even important? And that might not seem like a, um, such a, you know, such a good question, but I think that, um, of course, we are here to celebrate citizen science, 10 years of citizen science, which is, which is great, and I'm so much looking forward to listening to how the community uh, is evolving, to seeing all the great initiatives that you are doing in citizen science, um, learning new stuff. I'm so glad that you are here, um, Maina, um, to learn about the, the, the developments in Africa. Um, what we also see, and that is more a critical reflection maybe, um, is that funding and political support for citizen science might not be a given. We can see that in Germany, for instance, where um, there are developments. That I, I, I would like to dive into that a little bit more um, afterwards, where the ministry has also um, supported citizen science for a very, very long time um, and has built a lot of citizen science infrastructure, but also projects. Um, but there are shifts now, and we all know that Germany is not the only case. We know that um, policy might have to um, reprioritize funding um, in countries, in nations, due to, um, I don't know, different, um, different um, main points, different things that they, they, they need to prioritize financially. So, this is, I think, a very critical and crucial uh, point that we need to think about. What is the benefit of citizen science for policy? We need to make that very clear um, so that policy makers and policy networks understand why citizen science is crucial to them. And of course, we can see that um, there are a lot of benefits um, from citizen science to policy and along the whole policy cycle, like issue raising, but also policy implementation, policy evaluation, where citizen science can um, work into the policy cycle and provide evidence for, uh, for, uh, for instance, political measures. But also, um, I think it's very, very crucial that we um, show that citizen science also can leverage and can be a way to support, uh, for instance, global multilateral environmental um, agreements. You spoke of the SDGs, and we, we see that there is already initiatives showing the potential of citizen science for the SDGs. We do see a lot of research that goes into uh, benefits and also provides evidence on a larger scale, but also um, like uh, um, um, evidence that is based on case studies or uh, individual projects, but I think this is something that we need to dive into further. And with that, I leave it at that. Thank you. But I have another question. What kind of evidence do we have for the transformative impact of citizen science on policy, on science society? Can you give us a few examples, a few <laughs> examples of initiatives that <laughs> became change makers? Yeah, th that is a tricky question <laughs> because, I mean, you see all those, all those people, engaged people here, all those initiatives that are out there, um, 10 years of uh, citizen science projects. And I think it would rather be um, maybe not unfair, but it's difficult to point out specific projects yeah. because there, it's, we also, there are so many different levels that, uh, that uh, citizen science projects do have an impact on policy making or on, on policy cycle. And I think that 
there might be large-scale projects where um, data, and you have mentioned the Plastic Pirates project, for instance, where large-scale data um, feeds into uh, um, a political obligation, uh, obligatory monitoring, for instance. That might be one impact. But there are also much, much smaller scale projects um, that are more co-creative, where, wh where there is a very, very specific impact on policy, where political administration is working together in cities, for instance, mm -hmm. um, to do urban planning, or where uh, or there are so, so many different projects. So I would like to invite everybody, go look around, talk to your colleagues, look at the posters, you will find so much impact. And I think it's, it would, it, and what we need to do is really put that on the agenda, also for the scientific uh, community, so via papers, but also all the other uh, um, tools that we have and means that we have for political communication, so also um, have an impact there. But can you give a specific example? <laughs> <laughs> I won't, as you heard. <laughs> go, go, into, go into the conference and, and have a look around. Um, so um, I think um, that's the best way to explore and to learn. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, Dejan Dvorsik from the European Commission. The European Commission has been supporting citizens and societal engagement in research policy programs over the last two decades. Um, so the question is important, can citizen science make a significant contribution in decision-making processes, for example? Yes, thank you, and um, very well, welcome from my side, and um, congratulations for the orga well-organized uh, conference. Um, so indeed, like you said, the, in the context of, uh, at the EU level, mm -hmm. the citizen science has its roots already over two decades, basically, but very much prominently in the last couple of framework programs, uh, Horizon 2020, that has already finished, and now currently Horizon Europe. Um, we've seen a number of projects being funded at the EU, from the EU level uh, on the citizen science, uh, as in the previous framework program of, of about 60 million euros that went into this direction. In the current one, um, there are two projects uh, that are very well ongoing now, 11 million euros, uh, uh, and then another two that have started last year. Um, so indeed, in the, in, the, in the kind of a very funding side, we are very engaged, but also on the policy side. Mm -hmm. Um, there we have uh, in the Pact for Research uh, Innovation uh, the societal engagement, which also covers the citizen science, um, is uh, one of the key priority areas. Um, there is also the um, U uh, European Research Area, Action 14, where citizen science is very prominently there. And also in the context of the open science, which is very uh, pertinent uh, subject these days, uh, openly sharing data, having open access, uh, and also a um, question of um, evaluating research. Um, all these things are, um, I mean, are also very much uh, linked to the uh, citizen science. So indeed, like, like you see, there is uh, a lot of uh, support to it. Mm -hmm. There is also, I think, um, outcomes of, of, uh, of these projects uh, demonstrate really that it is important. Uh, and we've seen, uh, well, pirates were mentioned. Uh, there are some other very good examples where uh, outcomes of the projects uh, were then leading into a um, very concrete um, policy actions. Um, I know that there was one case on the um, that uh, integrated the um, the odors into the uh, zero pollution uh, action plan of EU, for example, which is really concrete uh, case where such uh, such impact has happened. And uh, they made a significant uh, contribution. Yes, exactly, yes. and that made a significant contribution, of course. Yes. I have also heard about the Curious Nuisen, this project in the Netherlands, which was also made a contribution. Uh, how have citizen science projects and their results contributed to shaping EU policy mm. over the past 10 years? I mean, we've heard already in some, uh, as predecessors have uh, shared already, how important the, you know, citizen science is for um, uh, um, developing trust into science, right? 
in uh, fighting misinformation, into questions of democratization of science, of uptaking uh, and innovation and so on. And yes, there are a lot of emerging projects at different levels. We know that um, the, the level of um, policy integration at national level is very different across Europe. Some countries are a bit ahead, some countries still have to do a little bit of work there. <laughs> Um, but we've heard about the mutual learning exercise where 10 countries have shared um, basically their experience, their uh, best practices and um, policies that they have implemented. And uh, definitely we see there um, emerging um, how, uh, how this has an impact on questions of, that has been mentioned, right? Pollution, environmental, water, air. Uh, questions of uh, urban development, smart cities, uh, and so on. The, um, that very, and also in the cases of crisis, right? In the cases of COVID and so on, and maybe potential future ones. This is also can really broaden uh, the, the the potential data collection, potential uh, filling in the gaps that maybe individual researchers, professional researchers, mm -hmm. cannot completely cover. So one of very good examples, for example, recently that, I, and that is really now actual is a question of um, uh, natural restoration uh, regulation that is uh, at the moment at the parliament level. Mm -hmm. But there, for example, you can see inside, it's very enshrined in the regulation itself, citizen science and citizen data collection. They're really prominently in and you can see how this actually then feeds into then real development of regulation at the mm -hmm. EU level uh, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it's being taken into account. And how can we maximize the added value of citizen science in decision making progress uh, processes on a European level? How can I you maximize? <laughs> maximizing it. I think that it, it, one of the key elements there is obviously in the policy making, we need evidence. We need to make decisions based on real evidence, data. And of course, that can come from research in general. But obviously, citizen science has a role here to play. And it's definitely a place where uh, the, this, this, this exchange really happens. So. Um, continuing when well one is obviously continuing spreading the, uh, the, the the understanding and also being aware that the citizen science exists further among the population uh, but feeding into reflection mechanisms of for example designing next framework program or uh, designing uh, key priorities areas around the policy um, this is all uh, places where data is very needed and citizen science can play there an important role. Thank you, Dian Wojcik. One of the biggest challenges facing our societies these days in general is uh, mistrust in science, which is closely connected to mistrust in democracy. Barbara Weitgruber, can a greater involvement of citizen science potentially build bridges? Of course, um, of course. Yeah. as I mentioned already, um, our overarching initiative, um, DN Austria, encompasses a wide range of activities um, and involving citizens um, is a very important one. And also starting at a very early age, uh, young age, yeah, yeah. Um, we have so-called science ambassadors going to kindergarten and schools, um, researchers just talking about research so that um, children and teachers, and they're all multipliers, of course, with their families and, and peers, um, simply learn um, processes of how research is being done um, and start trusting and might get inspired also and, and, and get into certain fields of studies, ideally. Um, and of course, um, involving um, citizens in, in mission-oriented research, for instance, um, both on the European level, but also in the implementation at the national level. You need the citizens, otherwise, um, also with technology and innovation, if the best um, technology is useless if it does not become a product which is actually wanted um, by the citizens. So all of these elements are very important um, in the whole research and technology and innovation Can you experience policy. that? Are there results? Can you experience that? Well, we have um, in Austria, we, we, for the implementation of the EU missions, we, ha we, we have uh, mission action groups and, and they work on, on action plans um, involving NGOs, different actors. Um, from the very beginning. Um, so I think it's important 
um, to in involve them from the very start. Um, and there is more and more interest. So I, I think there is, the people realize um, um, that it's, what is at stake, especially climate change, for instance, is a topic where it's pretty easy to get people involved. Thank you. Robert, get it to work. Yeah. Okay. Uh, last but not least, Maina Muniafu, speaking from your experience as a vice chair of Citizen Science Global Partnership, also chair of Citizen Science Africa Association. How do you think citizen science can impact politics and societal development okay. on a global <laughs> yeah. uh, level? Th thank you, Christoph. And uh, of course, first of all, I really thank uh, Daniel and Florian for helping me to be here all the way from Africa. Uh, Francoise Gray from the University of Geneva, and among others. I think uh, globally the big question is always on uh, what, what was the extent, what is the extent of student uh, citizen participation in decision making, in policies. Uh, and I think we can also see that uh, we have a lot of conventions, agreements, plans to deal with environmental challenges as they are right now. Uh, these we can see it's really questionable. How successful have we been? And as the conference uh, theme states, this obviously calls for a change in the way things uh, are done. And I see uh, using citizen science as one of the ways in which we can uh, create a change in this. Um, it's very heartening to hear about Europe. Uh, 10 years ago, you had hardly anything going on. That's where we are in Africa. There's hardly anything going on. Uh, it's also good to see that the uh, global community is organizing itself. We have a citizen science uh, global partnership. And uh, through its uh, efforts, you can see that we now have something in Africa, 2017. We have something in Asia, Ibo America, among other things. So I think there is an effort. And certainly, citizen science is the way to go. Thank you. If you have any question, please keep them and keep them in mind. Uh, there will be a possibility at the end of the discussion. Uh, yeah, what's important to strengthen citizen science? Maybe mainstreaming is also important. Integration of citizen science not only in funding. Austria, as we heard, is explicitly naming citizen science, it, citizen science in its national European research area action plan. Uh, in which ways, Barbara Weidgruber, has citizen science become a mainstream topic in Austria with regard to strategies, fundings, also institutionally? Well, um, we tried um, and, and we have started in, in 2015 with our uh, research action plan um, to actually embed um, citizen science and responsible science in all overarching strategies. Um, it was mentioned already um, the policy on open science and the European Open Science Cloud, um, but also, um, and, and more important, so uh, the National Development Plan for Public Universities, because that's the guiding um, document for all the public universities, um, and we have then performance agreements um, with the universities, and they, they then know that um, citizen science and responsible science are important um, topics also for the ministry regarding funding. But it's also in the Austrian strategy for research technology and innovation 2030, which is um, the overarching political strategy uh, for the whole research policy. Um, and that's broken down in three year pacts for research technology and innovation which come with money. Um, so the, the whole funding for the research policy in Austria is linked to these pacts for three years and our performance agreements with our funding agencies and our research performing organizations are then also uh, based on the, on the pacts and responsible science, citizen science um, as methods, they are all also embedded in these pacts. So, so what we try to do is to mainstream them in the political strategic documents on a long-term basis um, that come with funding. And of course, we also have competitive funding programs. You already mentioned Sparkling Science, which is one of the early ones actually all, all across Europe mm -hmm. since 27, where um, 
universities, research organizations work at eye level with citizen scientists and pupils on joint projects, um, and that has been prolonged. Um, and it's, it's continuing, and, and we also have a lot of other activities. The Austrian Science Fund um, funds top up um, for citizen science in excellent project. And to, just to show that there is no controversy between excellent research and, and citizen science research, and I think that's important. Why do you think Austria has a very active citizen science community? Would I? Well, I, I, it's been, um, I think it was a window of opportunity also when um, Öster Forst was, was um, established. Um, the framework conditions were there, um, both um, in the institutional level. Um, we had an inspired uh, state secretary at that time who put a lot of funding also in, in open innovation, citizen science, responsible science. Um, and in, then we decided to do a lot of strategic steps so that we'll continue um, independent of ministers or ministries. <laughs> Independent. Okay, Barbara Weitgruber has two heads, two roles. She is also member state co-chair of Iraq, the European Research and Innovation Area Committee, uh, which advises European Council, European Commission, also the member states on research policies. Barbara, what can and will Iraq do strengthen citizen science in the new era policy agenda? Well. Um as most of you probably know, um, we are now implementing the ERA policy agenda until 2024, um, and the action line was already mentioned where citizen science is included. But what is important, um, there are other action lines which are, I think, much more impactful. Research assessment is one of them. Um, Careers in research is another one where a council recommendation was adopted uh, with a diversity of careers in research, including um, different methods, citizen science, outreach activities, uh, being seen as valuable as other careers in research. Um, and also uh, knowledge valorization, um, impact and value for society and economy also um, including citizen um, science engagement. So these are action lines already going on, um, and there are very structural action lines, so we assume, and there's a lot of support among the member states that they will continue. And the so-called co-creation process um, between um, the European Commission and the member states, but also all the associated countries to the respective um, European Research Framework Program are also there, um, has already started in the um, forum, in the ERA forum, and also in ERAC, uh, where actually next week there will be a strategic discussion on the next um, policy agenda. Um, and what is important, um, there were a lot of proposals um, and several of them regarding also citizen science, um, which are now merged into one um, overarching uh, proposal. And um, we, we need more than half the EU member states supporting action lines in order to be part of the next era policy agenda. And it looks good, but their lobbying is, does never hurt. So um, all of you also have a national hat, so please go back to your ministries because uh, ERAC is the committee of DGs for research in the respective countries um, so that there is positive signals next week but also at the end of June where there will be the official ERAC opinion. Um, you know there will be a new commission, um, so uh, the next ERA policy agenda will only be tabled by the new commission at, as early as possible next year. Um, and both the, the Polish and the Hungarian presidencies are very willing that uh, there will be a swift adoption of the next era policy agenda. But the focus should still be on the one that's going on, and there's a lot of, in it uh, for citizen science, also in other action lines, and lobbying for the next one, please. Oh, thank you. Can you pass the micro to Dejan? <laughs> Maybe a similar question. Citizen science has a place in various European programs, and is supported by the European Commission, but the, I think the community is concerned about whether this will continue. Uh, what is the European Commission's position on citizen science for the future, Diane? 
Yes, indeed, the key question, right? Um, <laughs> key question, and yes. uh, <laughs> indeed, I mean, you are right. It's a timely question because the, it's a very timely question uh, because the reflections on how the next framework program will look like are have already kicked off and they are well on the way. Um, obviously, first thing that we need to do is to understand what kind of a challenges we will be facing in the future. It's a little bit difficult exercise because nobody can predict the future, obviously, but from what we see, right? And the important, there are several important inputs that will feed into the reflection of the constructions of the next uh, framework program um, that would start in 28. Um, is, um, one is the evaluation, ex post evaluation of the Horizon 2020, which have come up earlier this year already. Um, then the, there is an ongoing review uh, and assessment of the missions uh, which also will uh, be one of the elements feeding into these reflections. Very importantly, an interim evaluation or midterm evaluation of Horizon Europe. So how are we doing now and halfway through the program? Um, and uh, also there is a high level group of experts that have been assembled and has already started working. They started as of uh, end of last year, uh, chaired by Professor Manuel Heitor. And uh, we expect somewhere in uh, October, November, a report, so towards the end of the year, a report from this high-level group, which will also provide uh, an advice over how to structure, how the architecture of the next framework program could look like, and how to address maybe important challenges. Um, so as Barbara has already said, we are also in the, in, the, in the time of political change. So the European elections are uh, in front of our doors, basically. Um, we, there is, in a way, uncertainty of you know, how the, who will be in the Commission, who will be in the European Parliament, how the college, so the assembly of the commissioners of the European Commission will look like who will be the commissioner for the research, for example. Um, so all these are open questions, but we hope that this will be cleared out by the end of the year, maybe early next year. And uh, then, uh, importantly, before the proposal for the next framework program, which is supposed to come out mid next year already, we need and we would like to have a steer given by this new commission. So that is important for us. Um, and, but in the meantime, we are not, of course, there are a lot of things going on, reflections, and we are very much curious to hear and uh, we are collecting basically voices. I mean, we are really receiving a lot of position papers and uh, other kind of feedback of experience of the current uh, programs and what, what the research community, but also society would, look, would like to have in the next one. Um, and in that case, for example, I would really <laughs> ask, like Barbara said, you know, lobbying never hurts, you know, <laughs> voice being heard, it's good. So uh, this, this needs of uh, citizen science also have to be uh, voiced loud enough to be heard, to be taken into account properly. I'm sure it will not, this, these are things that will not go away. They're very anchored in number of these policy actions and uh, papers, so that will continue. Uh, and we know that this has been also very well mainstreamed, so integrated in the calls across, across the board of Horizon Europe. Um, but nevertheless, like I said, the reflections are there and the voices need to be brought up. Okay, thank you. A long question for a great question, Mark. Uh, but it's necessary. Thank you. Mein uh, Namuniafu, what are your main funding challenges? <clears throat> Thank you, Christoph. Uh, for Africa, I'll talk about Africa. The funding challenges obviously are very huge. I think mainly it's because uh, if, you look, if you consider that the uh, African Union has requested all countries to at least give 5% of their GDP equivalent to research, and the majority of the countries are between 1% and 3%. Okay, some are on 0.05%. So it's a, it's, a, it's a really big problem. I think uh, one of the things that uh, we're planning to do uh, with my committee is to have a conversation with the uh, African Union. Uh, having had so many good things about the European Union, I, will, I hope that they'll share some ideas with them and so that they can start pushing the countries. Uh, they have a scientific committee, which hopefully can also look at it. But uh, having said so, we have a lot of uh, 
uh, non-government organizations which are really involved. What we have to do as the Sitsa Africa Association is to create that platform which will uh, highlight the opportunities which are there for funding, which will show which kind of funding has gone to which kind of project, and then avoid replication. So in that way, we really think that we can get some uh, funding growing. I think funding usually grows from zero, hopefully towards 100%, mm. and this is what we're aiming to do. And which strategies is Citizen Science Africa pursuing to strengthen and mainstream citizen science in Africa? Uh, obviously, there's been some positives, like the Bureau uh, Statistic Offices in many countries have uh, resolved through the push from the UN statistics to start using citizen data. I think that's a huge step forward. Mm -hmm. So by keeping on highlighting, by keeping on talking and holding conferences, talks uh, with the government, uh, the, the, the public officials, I think we'll be able to start bringing it to the fore. We already have a lot of opportunity for that because there's a lot of gaps where there's no data. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's an opportunity to start filling it up with citizen data. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Maina. We had been talking about funding, about politics. I think we have also to talk about academia, about research assessment. The fundamental question is surely how citizen science can be given a valuable place in the science. And I think, doesn't citizen science contradict the academic rules, especially the criteria of excellence? Maybe there is something which has to change. Susanne Hecker, what's your experience in this area? What do you think needs to change in the European science system to help support and promote citizen science? Mm -hmm. So the question back would be, what is the European science system? Is okay. that, does that <laughs> exist uh, at all? I mean, what we see uh, also within this community is that from in, in very different countries, the science systems looks, look very different. And also the state of citizen science is, is, is at very, very different levels, obviously. So, um, I think what, what needs to be done, and that, that here EXA, of course, can play a pivotal role, is, is, to, is to really uh, um, learn about the different situations in different countries, understand them better, also understand the political systems. I mean, we have excellent uh, um, example here, um, what we heard from Mainu, but also within Europe, that's, it's, it's pretty much similar, that we need to, to better understand first. Um, what is going on from different countries and also here I'm, I'm happy to learn from, from you uh, during this conference which is a great opportunity. Um, and um, uh, you, you mentioned the, the, the point of excellence. I mean within Europe we see developments that uh, aim at rethinking the, the terminology or the term of excellence within science uh, going maybe away from uh, peer-reviewed publications and third-party funding towards more inclusive uh, uh, concepts and um, uh, frameworks of how uh, research can best be assessed in given all the circumstances that have been uh, mentioned earlier by the different speakers here as well. So for instance the COARA agreement, the, uh, um, agreement, uh, the, the, the agreement on uh, research assessment uh, which has been signed uh, by various uh, European, uh, European uh, institutions that, that we, we can see within Europe that this is discussed more and more and um, for instance, um, and I bring in the, the German example as well, we have a prize for citizen science which aims at um, uh, highlighting uh, scientific excellence uh, w through citizen science which I think is a, a very good um, approach to show that also we have impact in academia. Um, not only in society and policy, but also academia. And here, um, we started conversations with a lot of scholars, um, uh, international scholars, about what is the terminolo uh, terminology of excellence within, this, uh, within this, this area. And we can see that the thinking goes beyond that. So I think that, that is a good step, a very good step through Quara, but also those discussions towards um, what is excellence. At the same time, um, um, I think that of course, we know that funding is uh, is very important, and also um, um, the, the the institutionalization of citizen science. Of course, that those are very very important points. But coming back to my to my first point, it's very important that we, as we are here, we celebrate. We also reflect on what is our 
what is the added value that, that, we, that we have, that we can share um, within academia um, so that we are drivers for that change uh, within the science system as well. I think this is, this is very important. And of course, we need the support. We can't do that on our own. We need the support of policy, um, but also of society, of the various stakeholders which are involved in, in this endeavor. Thank you, uh, Pastor Barbara Weidgruber. Do you observe any changes in research assessment? Well, um, first of all, the Austrian Citizen Science Network already uh, did that in 2018. So um, pioneers, one more time, I guess. Um, criteria pertaining um, not just scientific standards and collaboration, but also open science, communication ethics, and data management. Um, so I think um, it's important uh, that these communities um, do their work. Um, and as was mentioned, the um, discussion now on the European level and on the, all the national levels with all the funders will definitely make a difference in how um, projects are evaluated and it's linked again, I mentioned it before, the careers in research because in the end um, research assessment is closely linked to careers in research, um, what uh, institutions are looking for. So if the recruitment procedures change because um, there are different um, careers which are equivalent, um, then of course um, outreach activities, entrepreneurship, citizen science um, will or might be even more valuable for certain institutions than peer-reviewed, um, highly cited um, researchers. Mm -hmm. What are the Ministry of Education, Science and Research and also other funders uh, doing to promote the integration of citizen science into research assessment systems? Well, um, there was a, a working group set up actually two years ago um, consisting of the whole, sec whole, whole higher education sector, f all the funding agencies and research performing organizations working um, on, well, um, guidelines or recommendations for careers in research, um, also including the discussion, the research assessment. Um, and these recommendations will actually be um, um, discussed and presented next week in a dissemination workshop. Um, and they are along the lines of the European recommendation and, and the, the Council um, decision on the careers, so very diverse careers in research. Um, and we now hope, of course, that as it was bottom-up work, um, providing these guidelines, that all the institutional commitments are now coming and the implementation will take place at the institutional level as well. And it's a topic for our um, performance agreements with our universities. So mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a mix of bottom up and top down. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, mine, another question. Can you give us a few examples of initiatives in Africa that have leveraged citizen science to create a direct positive impact? I, I think they're numerous and as I said earlier, uh, documentation is a problem. I think uh, they rotate around water. We have a very recent one, uh, Youth Marketplace Agency, which has gotten the attention of UNESCO, collecting water data in Nigeria. We have litter collection in uh, Ghana. Uh, we have uh, quite a bit on biodiversity, simply because we have communities still living with the large mammals, uh, particularly the explosive ones like lions. And I think there's uh, something called spot around where we're trying to uh, involve the communities in uh, getting the sensors of the, of the animals. Among other things, we have mangrove ecosystems, we have forests. So there's uh, no shortage of efforts. It's just a question of their coordination so that the left hand knows what the right hand <laughs> is doing. And then a lot of things revolve around water. I think water is very big for us in Africa because a lot of communities still draw their water straight from the river. I saw a very beautiful river here going through Austria, looking very clean. Uh, that would be a very good source for us in Africa. I don't know how many people draw their water out of that river direct, but then uh, you need to get that data on that. So the initiatives are many. It's just a question of coordinating them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Maina. Now there will also be an opportunity for, opportunity for questions from the audience. Uh, as from experience, I would like to make a few simple rules. Please, only one question, uh, one question per persona. Uh, try to ask in one or maximum two sentences. And 
uh, ask genuine questions. Don't please make statements. Um, the, uh, you know what I mean. The audience will thank you. Uh, uh, for the microphone, we have this cube. And you have to speak directly. I don't know. You have to speak directly into the cube. Who is the first with a question? I will. I got it. Thank you. I have a question from Maina. You were mentioning how uh, the Citizen Science Association in Africa is where Europe was 10 years ago, and it seems to be we are in this momentum, you know, that it's infecting the whole world. So what more can we do other than the global strategies we're already doing? What more can we do to truly infect the whole world uh, robustly with citizen science? Okay. Shall I answer immediately? Or are we collecting the questions? Sorry. <laughs> uh, who is the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it's very important. You are really right up there right now as Europe and uh, continue getting those partnerships. Uh, look into, they like calling it uh, North-South uh, partnerships. Look into, uh, hopefully when we get our platform uh, up and rising, we already have a very strong partnership with the European uh, EXA. So we can just look into the partnerships. What is it that then we can then do uh, for both sides? Uh, what are you talking about? Like uh, air quality. I think you've been good on air quality. That is something that is ignored in Africa. Because at one time there's uh, bad air, next moment everyone says, ah, but the air is clean again. So areas like air quality, biodiversity, I think that's another very good one uh, that we can look at. So it's just a question of the partnerships. Next one, please. Uh, so, can you can just throw me Uh, thank you so much for this question. Actually, I, I had a very similar one, but I, I'm going to reframe it to actually ask the whole panel. Um, I really want to applaud, like, you know, Maina for the resilience. I mean, I, you said there's not a lot of, like, citizen science happening right now in Africa, but what I have seen, it's excellent. I mean, I really want to applaud the resilience and creativity, how to make that all happen. So I just, just want to really acknowledge that. Um, my question is, uh, because we heard about how we can support you, which I would be happy to do. What, how do you all see the future of citizen science? What do you see citizen science be in the next 10, 50, 20, 25, 30 years? I know it's a big question, but I would love to hear that. I think there will nobody answer the question. No, Susanne, my dear. Yeah. Okay, um, I go for 10, <laughs> 10 years. Um, in 10 years, citizen science is, is uh, one of the main pillars um, when it comes to um, addressing uh, global, multilateral, uh, political uh, frameworks so that citizen science feeds into those. Um, uh, and we do that through scaling up citizen science projects uh, to a wider frame um, and through the partnerships that Mainu uh, already mentioned so that we have projects that run in similar ways uh, with a similar setup in uh, Europe, in uh, uh, Africa, in South America too, and others um, to, uh, to feed into those um, frameworks and, um, and, it, and citizen science thus is recognized um, as a very uh, important uh, political instrument as well, while still uh, serving the uh, academic and scientific purposes. Thank you, Susanna. And there's also another question, please. Yes, hello, Dylan Verhul. Um, as a European citizen, uh, a question for Dejan. I see a lot of new interesting projects coming from Europe being funded by the EU. And what I also see is that each project develops its own new technical solutions. And since we're talking about reuse, even of uh, clips for badges, how can we make sure that in Europe we can reuse existing technology over countries, share with countries. How do we make that happen? Okay, there you are. Yes, um, thank you. Indeed, a very interesting question. It is very pertinent as well. Um, I think that indeed there is a question of consolidation of outputs that are coming from these projects. How can this be indeed reused? We, we know that um, there are platforms through which this can be already done. 
um, especially when we talk about when we talk about more digital side, for example, there's a lot of happening there. When we talk about data, when we talk about maybe even some other digital objects like software and so on. So this is one of the prime, let's say, initiatives that is covered by the European Open Science Cloud. So which is working hard towards being able, where where also citizens obviously and researchers can uh, share. Uh, openly the data and uh, also use and uh, be able to access resources because it's not only about what you come out but also to get there sometimes you need some infrastructure some means in order to be able to process to store to analyze what you're doing and definitely that is what the let's say open science but particularly in this case uh, open Science Cloud, European Open Science Cloud is about, and that would be one of the ways to deal with it. Thank you, Dian. Time is running, but one or two questions are still possible, yes? Uh, impact and change is a long-term gain. Uh, politics is a short-term game. How do you reconcile the two? <laughs> Well, from the administrative level, as I mentioned before, um, getting things into legal acts help. Um, and our strategy is um, complemented by a law on funding research um, over three year periods. Um, a growth path funding for research is actually embedded in this legal act. And all our research performing organizations and research funding agencies have their three year agreements based uh, on this legal act. Um, so that, uh, of course, parliament can change legal acts if politics won't, but that's very unusual in Austria. Um, so th this long-term um, framework um, is, is already there. Um, and of course, um, for each new government, for each new minister, um, administration needs um, to depict things in a way that they think it, they are sexy. But that's what, why we are here for. So I think, um, and it, it's, it's become so normal um, that it, I think uh, citizen science is now being, main, it has been mainstreamed, it, it's, it's, it's a method. Um, and if the research community and the research performing organizations, the universities, the funding agencies simply continue to do so, um, I think it, it, it then, of course, um, other continents um, in partnership um, can be strengthened and, and it should be the, the, a, norm, a normality. But it's true. I mean, of course, politics always want shorter terms um, and they want to be re-elected. Um, but I think there's a lot um, that, especially citizen science, is so sexy for media. I mean, you have these nice pictures with a lot of young people. Um, <laughs> you have climate change. I mean, it's true. I mean, it's a lot of topics uh, that are so close to the heart of politicians. So it's actually, it's, it's one of the easy ones. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Barbara. So we come to the end. Closing words, please. One sentence. What is the number one best way to support citizen science? <laughs> What do you think? <laughs> you want to start? <laughs> yeah, because as soon as you asked that question, so many things popped into yeah. mind, and I was trying to grab one of them. I think, uh, obviously, is to strengthen the partnerships that are working around citizen science. If it was possible, ensure very good funding for them. Whatever they propose, give them that money. <laughs> when they bring the data, incorporate it into your policies, into your laws. That will be it for Thank me. You. Well, it's to include citizen science in all the relevant framework conditions, from research assessment to careers, to funding, um, so that they are really embedded um, and an integral part on the national and European levels. Now it's, it's getting harder, right? <laughs> um, I would say keep going. I mean, you, this, you're the community. You're driving this. You are doing this. You're putting so much effort into this. Um, do it. Just continue doing it with all the enthusiasm that is here in the room. Um, and yeah, go out. Go into the partnerships. Go and speak to policy. Go and speak to academia. Y you are the ones. Thank you.
um, <laughs> last one. I could very easily repeat what uh, <laughs> Barbara said. So framework conditions have to be there in order for, for it to flourish. But equally, I could uh, support that, yes, at the end of the day, you know, organize, organizing the, the, yourself in, a, in a communities and make the voice heard, it's also equally important. It's very sexy at the political level, but it's also very practical in everyday lives. So that's why. Thank you. Thank you very much for... Thank you very much for your contributions. It was an interesting discussion. And I'm sure you will have a very interesting three days here in Vienna. Good luck. Thank you, Firmas. Thank you for being here.